But we're looking at Hebrews 12, and the theme of this is running the Christian race, because that's what he mentions in verse 1. There is a woman by the name of Catherine Byers. She is 85 years old, and she ran the Boston Marathon on April 16th, uh, 2018, and it took her seven hours and, uh, what does it say there, 50 minutes to finish the race. She was 85 years old. Imagine running the Boston Marathon at that age. Well, you know, the Bible says you and I are all in a race, and God wants us to finish the race well. We're going to finish the race as Christians when we die, but God wants us to make sure that we run the race with endurance. He wants to make sure that we run the race with the maximum effort. Now, remember, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of Jewish Christians who had come out of Judaism. They were initially convinced that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the Old Testament. And some of them, because of persecution, were tempted to go back to Judaism. And so the writer of Hebrews tells these Jewish Christians not to go back. And he has to convince them that Jesus is greater than everything and everyone in the Old Testament. He's greater than the prophets. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than Joshua. He's greater than the high priests. On and on and on, he makes that argument. Now, he's going to get to the challenge, the application, and he's basically going to tell them, stay in the Christian race. Don't go back to Judaism. I want you to run this race, and I want you to finish well. And what he does is he gives us several principles in this chapter that help us to run the Christian race. You are in the Christian race whether you think you are or not. If you're a Christian, you're in the race by default. The question is, what kind of runner are you? And again, there are a lot of Christians in the American church today that are not running the race, fixing their eyes on Jesus. They're not running with a maximum effort. There's a lot of spiritual laziness in the American church today because a lot of people just want Sunday religion, especially in the South. When you go up to the Northeast, the line of demarcation is a lot clearer. But in the South, there is a religious spirit, and many times people think running the race is simply coming to church on Sunday, which is part of it, as John said. But you and I know that that's only half of running the race with a maximum effort. So what did we look at last week? Let me review several principles that we looked at last week to help us run the race with endurance. First of all, I noted for you that you must remember others who have run before you. Secondly, you must remove obstacles or hurdles in your Christian experience. It's something like an encumbrance or maybe it's a sin that's going to slow you down. Thirdly, persevere or don't quit. You're going to get knocked down in the race. Sometimes life is very difficult, and you're going to want to give up running the race, but the writer says, don't quit. Number four, he says, focus on Jesus. Jesus is the finish line. He is the one that we are to focus on. Why? Because he ran the race all the way to the end, and he was taken up to glory. He endured the cross because he knew the souls that he would purchase when he died on the cross. And so you and I are to focus on Jesus. Fifthly, we are to accept God's discipline in our life. When we go through trials in life, that is a form of God's discipline. Either God is chastising us for things we have done wrong, or God is using the trial. He didn't cause the trial, but he's using it to train us, to mold us, and to shape us. And so we have to have that perspective that anything I go in through life is God's discipline. And then number six, this was the last one we looked at last week, consider your impact upon other people. He says at the end there, he says, strengthen your hands, strengthen your knees, And he says, I want you to stay in your lane as you're running the race. Why? So that you don't influence other people in a negative way. Because if you stop running the race or you're lazy spiritually, you know what you're doing? You're influencing other Christians. People look to your example, especially your children. Because if you tell your children you need to follow Jesus and you're not following Jesus, you're basically making a negative impact in their life. Well, there's a seventh principle, and here's where we pick up for this evening, and that is this. We need to be peacemakers. We need to be peacemakers. Notice what he says in chapter 12, verse 14. He says, pursue peace with all men. Now, here he's talking about relational peace. And here's a question you and I need to ask ourselves. Are we sowers of peace, 
or are we more sowers of conflict? And I think that's very timely in our day and time today. As a general rule, God wants us to be peacemakers. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, blessed are the peacemakers. However, truth often divides. And as I said Sunday, you have to balance making peace with other people and also speaking the truth in love. And we got to be careful we don't swing the pendulum because some churches are all peace and they don't want to speak the truth in a spirit of love. And listen, truth divides. Jesus was the prince of peace, but he also was the king of truth. When Jesus is coming back in Revelation 19, he has a sword coming out of his mouth, which is symbolic of the fact that he is one who speaks the word of God, who speaks the truth of God. And so we have to balance love, peace with other people, and also speaking the truth. And listen, it's a case-by-case basis. That's where wisdom comes in. We have to know when to speak the truth, and if truth divides, we let it divide. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, I did not come to bring peace, but I came to bring what? A sword. See, it depends on the situation you're in. You know, in our times today, we want to be peacemakers, but sometimes when you speak the truth in our culture, people don't like it, and it divides. If I tell people that Jesus is the only way to get to heaven, and there aren't multiple paths to heaven... That's not a popular message. And so that's going to make people angry. Now, obviously, you want to say it in a way that's loving and not condescending, but that's going to divide. Or if I say this today, not all cops are bad. Some people, that's not popular, but that is truth. And you know what? That divides. And so we got to know in what situations to be peacemakers and when to speak the truth, because sometimes we can gaslight a situation with our incendiary speech, and we can rile people up. And again, there is a time where we have to speak the Word of God, and it's going to divide people in our culture. People are not always going to like us. But as a general rule, we want to be peacemakers with other people. Now, how can we do that? Well, let me give you some suggestions. You'll notice them up on the screen there. First of all, watch your words and your actions. Again, you don't want to be so sensitive to the point where you're walking on eggshells, but you do need to weigh your words and your actions and your tweets. Overlook minor offenses. If you want to be a peacemaker, don't get offended so easily all the time. Another thing is apologize if you need to. You see, a person who's a peacemaker, they learn to say they're sorry, and they own up to their faults. Another thing is bless others and don't curse. You know, when people are cursing you, if you want to diffuse the situation, bless them. And I'll tell you what, that's the hardest thing to do, is it not? I know for me it's very difficult when I debate people online. I can't tell you how many times I've had to erase a sentence. Not because I'm using profanity, but I've come across too strong and I have to say, all right, how would Jesus handle this situation? And so we have to learn to bless and not curse. Seek or grant forgiveness. Don't hold grudges. And then finally, resolve conflict as much as possible. Sometimes you can't always do that, but to be a peacemaker, you got to resolve conflict. You got to deal with grudges or hurts that you have. What does it say in Ephesians chapter 4? Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil a foothold. Interesting word in the Greek for foothold, it's the word tapos. We get the word topography from it. Don't give Satan a plot of ground. Don't give him a topographical area where he can establish a beachhead and launch attacks in your life because you're holding on to bitterness and anger in your life. I was reading a story, it was a true story about two sisters who lived together, they weren't married, and they got in some type of spat. And they got so angry with each other, they decided that they were going to separate the house and they used a piece of chalk to divide the house. One slept on this side of the bed, the other slept on this side of the bed, and they literally would walk by each other all day, and this went on for a year. They wouldn't say a word to each other. You see, that's not being a peacemaker. And you know what? To be a peacemaker, you often have to die to yourself, because sometimes you don't want to make peace with other people. If people hurt you, if they offend you, you have to forgive them, and you got to try to resolve the situation. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to be bosom pals. 
but it simply means that you want to be a peacemaker. Why? Because one of the fruits of the Spirit is what? Peace. And if I'm a person of peace, I'm going to dispense peace to other people. On the other hand, if I'm a person of acrimony, if I'm a person of constant conflict, if I'm a person of constant rancor with other people, that manifests the fruit of the flesh. And so again, balance peace with truth. Don't go all peace to the expense of truth, but listen, if you're all truth and you're no peace, you know what you're going to do? You're going to produce Phariseeism in the church. There's another thing that he gives us here if we're going to run the race the way he wants us to, and this is number eight in our little list, and that is pursue holiness or growth. Pursue holiness or growth. Notice verse 14. He says, pursue peace with all men and the sanctification without which no one will see the Lord. Some of you have the translation of holiness. It's the same word, sanctification, holiness, or the word saint. That's all in the same word group. What he's saying here is, you and I, if we're going to run this race the way God wants us to, we have to pursue sanctification or holiness, or we would say spiritual growth. Sanctification is simply, at the moment of salvation, God sets me apart unto himself, he makes me holy positionally, but then practically, I need to live out what I am positionally. See, positionally, I am holy. On a scale from 1 to 10, 10 being the highest in terms of holiness, I'm a perfect 10 in terms of my position before God or my state before God. But there's a difference between practice and position. Even though I'm perfectly holy in my position, some days I'm a negative 2. Some days I'm a 5. Some days I'm an eight. You see, we have to allow our practice to match our position. Because I am holy, because I am sanctified, therefore I need to pursue that in my life. Now remember, sanctification is not something that you arrive at fully in this life. There is a brand of theology, I think it's lost popularity today, but within certain Pentecostal holiness churches, within certain Wesleyan denominations, they teach what is called entire sanctification. You can reach a point in your Christian life where you no longer willfully sin anymore. You say, well, what do they do when they blow it? Well, they define it as a mistake. See, what you have to do is you have to redefine it because you can reach a point where you never willfully sin anymore. Listen, the Bible doesn't teach that. And you know what? Those who teach that know in their own hearts they're not being honest with themselves. That's why they have to redefine it. Sanctification is a process. You're not going to arrive at it fully in this life. You will be fully sanctified in the next life. That's called glorification. But until glorification happens, we have to pursue sanctification. It is a process. Sometimes it's two steps forward. Sometimes it's three steps back. And you know what God uses in this process? He uses his word. He uses prayer. The best tool that God uses in the toolbox of sanctification is trials, is suffering, When God puts us in the vice grip, when God breaks us, when he sifts us and he sands us, you know what that does? That speeds up the sanctification process. One of my favorite rides at Disney World, if you've ever been to Disney World, I've been twice, actually more. When I was growing up, my parents took me, but we had the privilege of taking our daughters twice. When I lived in Miami, we were near Orlando. And one of my favorite, um, I guess it's not really a ride, it's called the Carousel of Progress. And if you know it's a circle, go back to that previous slide here, you can see you sit in this, and what happens is it, by process, takes you to one station after another, and what it does, go to the next slide, it shows you how we have advanced as a civilization, particularly technologically. And of course, they have animation, they have climation doing their whole thing. It's called the carousel of progress, because in each stage, you see the process and the progress of how our society has evolved technologically. Well, let me ask you a question. Are you on the carousel of progress spiritually? Do you see progress in your life? Sometimes the progress is very incremental. It's very slow. And listen, sanctification is both passive and active. What do I mean by that? Well, it's active in the sense that I have to pursue it, but it's also passive in the sense that I have to depend on the Holy Spirit. It's a both and. My wife likes to garden. I don't garden at all. 
And so in our backyard, we have this little space, and it has a little dirt, and she went ahead and she planted, I guess it's some cucumbers. And so she dug up the dirt, and she put the seed in there. See, she was active in that process. She had to dig up the dirt, she had to plant the seeds, and then she had to cover it, but guess what? She's also passive in the process. Why? Because she has to rely on the sunlight, she has to rely on the rain in order to produce the growth. And so it was active and it's passive. Sanctification is an active process. If you don't get up and read your Bible, God's not going to make you read your Bible. He may prompt you, he may remind you, but he's not going to make you do it. You got to pray. You got to mortify the flesh and put to, deed the, uh, to death the deeds of the flesh. We all have to be active in our pursuit of sanctification, but listen, we can't do it in our own strength. It's passive. We have to depend on the power of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that produces sanctification. So who helps you to grow spiritually, God or you? The answer is both. Paul said, work out your salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians 2, but in the very next breath, he says, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. You see how those two truths are juxtaposed to one another? It's all of God, but it's all of me. And notice he says here that if you and I are not sanctified, no one will see the Lord. Now, that's a difficult passage, but there's two interpretations. The first interpretation of no one will see the Lord is simply this. If you're not living out your faith and you're not growing, not that you're going to be perfect or I'm going to be perfect, but if you're not consistently walking with God, other people will not see the Lord in your life. In other words, you're going to be a bad testimony. See, people see Christ in you. People see God in you. And we wonder why the world is turned off to Christianity because what do they see in the church? They don't see Christ, they see hypocrisy. And so that's one possible interpretation. No one will see the Lord in your life. The other is this. If you're not living a Christian life, you reveal that you're not saved and you're not going to see the Lord when you get to heaven. Now, there is a third view that says that if you're not walking in holiness and you die, you lose your salvation and you go to hell. That would be a third view. And so those are the three views. You got to decide what view you hold to on that. But listen, the Bible makes it very clear. I think we could say this unequivocally. First John says, if a person says that they know God, but they walk in darkness, he says they lie and they do not practice the truth. Not that you're going to be perfect, but if you're a Christian, you're going to bear fruit in your life. And if there's no fruit, there's no root, you are not saved. Well, there's a ninth thing that he gives here that you and I are to do if we're to run the race the way he wants us to run it, and that is this, avoid falling short of salvation. Avoid falling short of salvation. Now, this is one of those warning passages that is given in Hebrews. For those of you who missed the series earlier, what is a warning passage? Well, the writer of Hebrews, whoever it was, was writing to a group of Jewish Christians who had outwardly professed faith in Jesus Christ. But there were a number of them who identified with the Christian community but weren't saved. And so he writes this letter primarily, listen carefully, to the Christians. But as he's writing to the Christians, he stops and he gives an invitation or a warning. Kind of like John preaching to everybody in the church on Sunday morning, and he stops in the middle of his message and he says, now there may be some of you out here who don't know Jesus, and if you don't know Jesus, you better get right with God, because God has impressed on me that if you don't get right, you're going to end up in hell. See, he's addressing Christians, but then he gives a warning. Now, he gives a warning in chapter 2, chapter 4, chapter 6, chapter 10, and then in chapter 12. This is the final warning he gives. And this warning is telling them, avoid falling short of salvation. Why? Because there's a lot of people that come to church, they come right up to the brink of Christianity, and they die and they go to hell. Do you realize that hell is going to be populated with religious people that went to church? They came to church, they know the jargon, but you know what? They never fully crossed the line of faith. And the writer of Hebrews is warning them not to do that. Let's look at it in verse 15. He says, see to it that no one comes short of the grace of God. He's talking about the grace of God here in salvation. In other words, don't die without salvation. Too many of these Jews were coming close And what they were doing was going back to Judaism. And here's what he's implying. If you come 
close to salvation, but you go back to Judaism, back to the sacrificial system, back to the priesthood, he says, you're going to fall short of salvation. You're not going to be a Christian, and you're going to die and end up in hell. Now, in order to help them get this, that they shouldn't fall short of salvation, he uses three illustrations or three word pictures. These are fascinating. Here's the first illustration to help them not fall back into Judaism. Number one is a poisonous root, a poisonous root. Notice, if you will, verse 15. He says that no root of bitterness, which is a poison root, springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. The first illustration he gives, or word picture, to try to motivate them not to fall short of God's salvation is a poisonous root. Now, this verse often is taught by pastors to refer to this. You better not hold on to a grudge or you better not hold on to personal bitterness in your life because if you're angry at somebody and you won't forgive them, the only person you're poisoning is yourself. You're allowing somebody to live in your mind rent-free. And that's how it's often preached, and I'm not against that. The Bible does teach that principle to forget. But really, this has nothing to do with personal bitterness. He's talking about a poisonous root, listen carefully, being an apostate. The apostate is someone who gets close to Christianity, knows the truth in their head, but goes back and says, I don't want Christianity, and goes back to Judaism. Or today, someone who comes to church, they've been exposed to the Christian community, they hear the truth, they can regurgitate the truth, but they say, you know what, I don't want anything to do with Christianity, and they walk away from it. That is a poisonous root. And he says that poisonous root can defile many people by their unbelief and their rejection. An apostate is someone who held to a previous position, but they turn their back on it. Do you remember that guy I mentioned to you, Bart Erdman, several weeks ago, that guy that teaches at North Carolina? That would be an example of apostate who supposedly was in Christianity, and now he hates it, and he's turned his back on it. And he has corrupted many people. You say, are you sure that's the interpretation? Absolutely. You know why? Because he's quoting from Deuteronomy when he talks about the poisonous root. Look at Deuteronomy up on the screen, and you'll see clearly that he's referring here to a poisonous root, an apostate. Deuteronomy 29, look what it says. God is talking to the new generation that is going to go into the promised land. He says, now, not with you alone am I making this covenant and this oath. This is God talking to the people of Israel. He says, I'm not just making this covenant and this oath with you alone, but both with those who stand here with us today in the presence of the Lord our God and with those who are not with us here today. For you know, verse 16, how we lived in the land of Egypt and how we came through the midst of the nations through which we passed. Moreover, verse 17, you have seen with their abominations, in other words, he's saying, when your parents were in Egypt... You saw their abominations in Egypt, their idols of wood. That's what they worshiped in Egypt. You saw the stones that they worshiped, the silver and the gold, which they had with them. And then he says this, so that there will not be among you a man or woman, family or tribe, whose heart turns away today from the Lord our God to go and serve the gods of other nations that there will not be among you, here it is, a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. He says, look, you know the idols they worshiped in Egypt. He says, when you get into the promised land, he says, you better not imitate all the idolatry that you saw in Egypt. He says, or what will happen is there will be a root bearing poisonous fruit and wormwood. And notice he says in verse 19, it shall be when he hears the words of this curse that he will boast saying, I have peace though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart in order to destroy the watered land with the dry. In other words, this bitter root, this apostate that's going to turn away from the true God and fall into idolatry when they get into the land, God says that's the bitter root. And so the writer of Hebrews takes that language and he says, listen, there are some among you in the congregation, you need to be careful that you're going to fall short of salvation. And the first illustration, he says, don't be a poisonous root. 
Don't be that bitter plant that turns away from God and then you infect other people with your apostasy. And listen, that can happen to us. And I'll tell you what, it happens so much in the American church today because kids grow up in the church. And you know what a lot of kids do? They turn away from God when they get to college. 70%, they say, of kids that grow up in the church end up turning their back on God. Now, some of them come back after college. But many of them are lost to the universities. Have you noticed lately it's been very popular with a lot of Christians coming out now saying that they no longer believe in God? Joshua Harris, who wrote the book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye, which I never read the book because I didn't like the title. I love dating. So I was like, I ain't reading that book. (laughs) But how about this guy recently? You'll notice his picture up on the screen. John Steingard. He sang for a Christian band called Hawk Nelson. And I read a little bit about his story. He actually grew up in a Christian home and his dad is a pastor. And he said all these years... He would listen to the lingo and the jargon. He said, when I was up there performing, we would pray, and he said something was off. And here's ultimately what he said, which is typically the problem with a lot of people, is the problem of evil and suffering. He cannot reconcile how God is all-powerful, all-loving, and yet evil exists. And so he basically has come out now and says he doesn't believe in God at all. You say, was he saved? I don't know. I know 1 John says... They went out from us because they were not of us. And so what happens is with his influence and other people's influence in the media, they pull a lot of people away because people that are already struggling with doubt, when these people come out and say, well, I don't believe in God anymore, you know what it does? It validates their unbelief. How about you? Are you a poisonous root? Maybe your unbelief is affecting your children. Maybe your unbelief is affecting people on your job. He says, don't fall short of God's salvation. And the first illustration is a poisonous root. The second illustration is Esau. We come back to red. Notice, if you will, verse 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. And then look at verse 16. That there be no immoral. Now, he's going to talk about Esau here being immoral. The Bible doesn't say that Esau was sexually immoral, but we know from extra-biblical literature that the man was sex-crazed. That there be no immoral or godless, the word godless simply means profane or secular. He says, I don't want there in your congregation to be anybody that's immoral, and he may be referring to spiritual immorality here. I don't want anybody to be godless like Esau, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. For you know that even afterwards, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance. In other words, he cried after he sold his birthright, but his tears were not genuine repentance. He says, though he sought it with tears, he regretted his decision. Now, why is he using Esau? Well, notice what Esau did. Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for a pot of what? Stew. Now, Esau, the word in the Hebrew means red, and the stew that he wanted was red, so red wanted red. And what happened was he came in, he was famished, he was hungry, and he wanted to satisfy, watch this, his immediate appetite, and he was willing to sacrifice the future for the present. He was willing to sacrifice that which is sacred, his inheritance, his birthright, which allowed him to lead the family, which gave him a double blessing. He was willing to give up that which is sacred for that which is profane, which is what? Which is simply stew. He focused more on the material than he did the spiritual. And you know what the writer of Hebrews is saying? Don't be like Esau. Esau squandered his future for the present. And he's saying, look, don't go back to Judaism and don't try to get momentary satisfaction and meet your needs right now and you're going to sacrifice eternal life in heaven. He says, don't be like Esau. You know, we have a lot of people in the church today like Esau. I've witnessed to a number of people. Today I was at uh, Jippy Lube, had to get my oil change in the car, and uh, I was sitting in my truck, and the guy started talking to me. He's a young guy. We were talking football, and so I lifted up my thing, and I pulled out a track and a Calvary Chapel card. And I said, hey, man. I said, you go to church anywhere? He said, no, no. He said, I need to find a church. I said, well, I want to invite you out. 
He says, yeah, yeah. He goes, I already know right from wrong. And I said, well, <laughs> I said, well, listen, you need to come out. I said, because it's not a matter of right or wrong, although that's important. I said, it's faith alone in Jesus Christ that saves. And I can't tell you how many conversations that I've had with people who agree with you. He agreed with me, but you could tell he was a little bit standoffish. You see, people are willing to live for 30, 40, 50, 60, maybe 80 years in this life to satisfy their stew. They want their stew. They want their gusto now, and they're willing to give up eternal life, and they're willing to hedge on their bets that there's nothing in the next life. See, they're sacrificing their future for the present. Jesus said, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world but loses his what? His soul. And see, that's the short-sightedness. He's saying, look, I know you're persecuted, but don't get momentary relief just like Esau sold his birthright because he lived by his appetites. And listen, this is true of the Christian. There are a lot of Christians that are not investing in eternity. Why? Because they're living for the moment. They're living more for their children's sports. And there's nothing wrong with that in terms of them playing sports. But you know what? I remember in New Jersey, that was a big issue. People were consumed with their kids' sports. They didn't have time to advance the kingdom of God. How many Christians are living for their retirements? Nothing wrong with retirement, but listen, that's all they're living for is to have a comfortable life and they're not investing in the kingdom. Yes, they have enough fruit to show that they're saved, but they're not really sacrificing for the Lord. You see, what they're doing is they're sacrificing their future rewards in heaven because they want their earthly goods now. And listen, God has the best 401k that anybody could give. And you see, you got to be daily investing in your 401k in heaven. But so many Christians are investing in their 401k now. It's about this life. It's about my pleasure. It's about my joy. And again, we should enjoy life. There's nothing wrong with that. God is not a cosmic killjoy. But we got to be investing our life in that which has eternal value. And so some Christians are just like Esau. They're selling their birthright. And when they get to heaven and they stand before the Bema seat, you know what's going to happen? Wood, hay, stubble. When that fire hits the wood, hay, and stubble, it is combustible. Gold, silver, precious stone is what you do for Jesus that's going to last forever. And so he says, don't be like Esau. And then finally, he uses one other illustration to tell them not to fall short of salvation. The first one was a poisonous root. The second one was Esau. Thirdly is two mountains, two mountains. Now, what he does here, this is kind of interesting. He uses two mountains to represent two covenants. You had the old covenant, which is what some of them were tempted to go back to, and you had the new covenant. And these two mountains represent two covenants. Now, Mount Sinai is the first covenant. That's the first mountain that represents the old covenant. And then you have Mount Zion, which is the new covenant. And so here's the deal. Are you listening? Say amen. Everybody worships at one of these two mountains, law or gospel. Law is Mount Sinai. Gospel is Mount Zion. And so he's going to use this illustration, and here is his point before we read the passage. Don't go back to Mount Sinai. You were in Mount Zion. What are you doing going back to Mount Sinai? Mount Sinai is foundational. Mount Sinai is elementary school. You're in graduate school now in Mount Zion. What are you doing going back? So let's see what he says here. Verse 18, for you have not come to a mountain, that would be Mount Sinai, that can be touched and to a blazing fire and to darkness and gloom and whirlwind. Now, what he's doing here, he's talking about when the Israelites got to the base of the mountain at Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 19. Do you remember when, when God came down on that mountain? It was dark. It was gloomy. There were claps of thunder and spears of lightning. It was very, very foreboding. In fact, God told the people to get themselves ready because he was going to come down on the mountain. He said, I want you to clean yourselves up. He says, no sex between you couples. You are to be pure. And I'll tell you what, when God came down, what happened? The people were trembling, even Moses. And so look what he says here. There was, verse 19, the blast of a trumpet, the sound of words, which sound was such that those who heard begged that no further word be spoken to them. For they could not bear the command. Even if a beast touches the mountain, it will be stoned. You say, why was God that way? You know what God was doing here? To show Israel his holiness. 
Because listen, the people needed to see a fresh glimpse of God. They had gotten out of Egypt, which is idolatry, and so God was de-Egyptianizing them. He says, it will be stone. And so terrible, verse 21, was the sight that Moses said, I am full of fear and trembling. Now, this Mount Sinai represents the law. It represents Judaism. Nothing wrong with the law, nothing wrong with Judaism, but listen, it was temporary. Mount Sinai represents the law, but notice verse 22, here is Mount Zion, but you have come to Mount Zion. Mount Zion was a little hill there in Jerusalem. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriad of angels, to the general assembly, and to the church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. He says, look, you're coming to heaven. In heaven, in Mount Zion, that's the spiritual Mount Zion. He says, you're going to meet God. You're going to meet a whole host of angels. You're going to be there with all the saints in heaven. I was thinking tonight when I was taking a shower, I was like, Lord, I was thinking about my father-in-law, and I was like, I wonder if he's talking to Moses right now. I wonder if he's talking to Paul. What is he doing? What is Ravi Zacharias doing? What are all these people that we know, our parents that went before us, what are they doing right now? They're in a whole other realm in existence. Can't you wait to be there? He says, that's Mount Zion. That's the one you are at. He says, you're going to meet the spirits of the righteous men made perfect, and you're going to see Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the sprinkled blood which speaks better than the blood of Abel. You remember Abel when he offered up his animal sacrifice? That was good, but listen, it's nothing compared to Jesus' blood because he's the mediator of a new covenant. And so what he does here is he contrasts these two mountains. Let me break it down for you. Notice Mount Sinai. It's earthly. Mount Zion is heavenly. Mount Sinai is fear and judgment. Mount Zion is love and forgiveness. Mount Sinai is law, grace. Unapproachable, God is approachable. Moses drew near, all can draw near. Man, here, not the people of Israel, only Moses. Death, life, temporary, eternal. That's the difference. And you know what he's saying to them? He's saying, you are in Mount Zion. Why are you going to go back to Mount Sinai? Two covenants. Mount Sinai represents law. If you don't keep God's law perfectly, you are damned to hell. Do you really want to go back to that? On the other hand, Mount Zion is grace. All you got to do is admit your sin, repent, and trust in Jesus Christ, and God will forgive you of your sins. Listen to what Chuck Swindoll said. I love this quote. How foolish are those who have begun their upward trek towards the glorious top of Mount Zion to turn around and head for the jagged cliffs of Mount Sinai, end quote. Listen, there's a lot of people that come to church, they hear the gospel, they turn away from it, and they go into Buddhism. They go into Hinduism, they, get, they become Muslims. Or there are church people that get saved, and they get sucked into a church where it's all legalism, and they go back to Mount Sinai. And so he says, as he concludes this illustration of two mountains in verse 25, he says, see to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking God spoke on Mount Sinai. He's also speaking from Mount Zion. And he says, make sure you don't refuse him who is speaking. I remember growing up, my mom would yell at me all the time. She wore a belt around her neck, and she would say, Michael, I am talking to you. You need to listen. And I wouldn't listen, and I would get tattooed as a result. <laughs> See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking, for if those did not escape when they refused him. In other words, in the old covenant, when they didn't listen to God and they rebelled and they fell into idolatry and immorality, what did God do? He punished them. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape who turn away from him who warns us from heaven. It's the argument from the lesser to the greater. If God warned them at Mount Sinai and he warned them in the old covenant, if you don't keep my law and you go into idolatry, he says, I'm going to chastise you. How much more will God do that in the new covenant? In other words, if you turn away from God and you don't accept Christ, and you fall short of the grace of God, you're going to be doomed eternally. That's the point. And so if you and I are going to run the race, what's the point he's making? Don't fall short of salvation. Make sure you're a Christian. 
And he uses three illustrations to tell us not to fall short of salvation. He uses a poisonous root, he uses Esau, and he uses two mountains. Mount Sinai or Mount Zion? Well, there's one final principle for this evening if you and I are going to run the race, and this is number 10 in our little list, and that is engage in thankful service. Engage in thankful service. Notice, if you will, verse 27 or 26. And his voice shook the earth then. When God spoke from Mount Sinai, his voice shook the earth. Remember, it was trembling and everybody was scared. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. He's quoting Haggai chapter 2, verse 6 here. In other words, God shook the earth at Mount Sinai when they were at the base of the mountain. And he's saying, God shook the earth once. He's going to shake it a second time. When's that going to happen? During the tribulation period. God is going to wreak helter-skelter on this earth. Everything is going to be careening out of control. This expression, verse 27, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken. In other words, if God is going to shake the earth again, like he did at Mount Sinai, that means that what we see now is not permanent. It can be shaken. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. To put it in very simple terminology, this life is temporary. Don't invest your life only in this life. Why? Because it is temporary. God is going to shake this earth once again. He's going to change things. And look what he says here. Therefore, since we receive a kingdom which cannot be shaken. In other words, you and I are investing in an eternal kingdom. Let us show, here it is, gratitude, by which we may offer to God an acceptable service. In the Greek, this refers to our priestly service. Just like the priest would serve God in the tabernacle, you and I serve God with the ministry that he's given us. And notice he says, let's have an attitude of gratitude as we serve God. Why? He says this, for our God, verse 29, is a consuming what? Fire. That means wrath. Here's what Chuck Swindoll says about this passage, quote, our vision of God becomes clouded. We no longer see him as the all-powerful consuming fire, but as a warm glow on a distant horizon. He's right. We forget the God that we serve, but I want you to notice here that he says life is temporary. Your life is short and my life is short. All the stuff that we invest in, you're not taking it with you. And listen, if you have it, enjoy it, but don't make it your God. Are you investing your finances into the kingdom? Are you investing your time into the kingdom? Are you sacrificing for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because listen, if you're not, here's what you believe, despite what you say. You believe that this life is permanent. This life is all that matters, and he says he's going to shake it again. That means it's temporary. I was reading about in England, uh, there was these uh, group of guys that went into a bank, and they stole a lot of the boxes that people had their valuables in. They ripped off seven million dollars. And one lady, they stole her lockbox, and she was hysterical. She said, I had $500,000 of jewelry in that box, and she said, it was all that I had. She said, it was my life. And obviously, we grieve with her, but here's the deal. That stuff is temporary, and you know what? That's a word for us because we all struggle. And so, you know what God wants us to do? Engage in thankful service. We need to get involved. I'll end with this story. I was reading about a, a gal. In fact, her name is, let me see it here, because I know when you get into certain names, you can't remember them. Katie Lee. That's actually not too bad. Katie Lee. I have a Caitlin. She is from China. And this one woman had a house, and visitors would walk in her house, and then they would walk, and they would crawl in this tunnel that was 100 yards long. And when they got to the end of the tunnel, there was this little room where Katie Lee was. And you know what Katie Lee was doing in that room? She had a printing press. It wasn't sophisticated. And what she was doing was she was printing tracts to share the gospel and booklets. 
in Christianity. And these people would come through this tunnel in China, they would get the material, and they would begin to disseminate it everywhere. Well, after a while, the authorities caught on to this. They saw a lot of this material, and they didn't know what was going on. And so what they did was they began to question individuals, and nobody would confess up. They knew what was going on, but they never would rat her out. And so finally, the authorities said, here's what we're going to do. We are going to blow your house up until you tell us who is guilty of this. And so one by one, they began to blow up their houses, destroy them. Well, they finally got to that old lady's house. They went through the tunnel, and guess what? She was gone, her and her friends. They confiscated the printing press, and you know what? To this day, they said she's not allowed to see her family. She's not allowed to see her friends because she has to be incognito. Because in China, she would be arrested if she was caught or she could be killed. Listen, she's serving God with an attitude of gratitude. How about you? How are you involved? God doesn't want us to not be involved. He wants us to engage in thankful service. And so what have we learned tonight? We've learned how to run the Christian race. And what's the first thing we learned tonight? Say it out loud. He's going to put it up for you. What is it? Be a peacemaker. What's the second thing? You guys sound like uh, Charlie Brown. Remember the wah, 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 wah. Pursue holiness and growth. What's the next one? There you go. Conviction. Did we miss one? No? All right, I'm losing my marbles. All right, let's pray.